What a wonderful privilege that it's been to be here with you all uh, during these days. Um, thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you for the wonderful conversations and encouragement that uh, I've received from so many of you. The theme of my talk tonight is Come Be a Nobody for Christ. So let me start just by sharing just a little bit about my background and my family's background and story, the story of God and His grace in our lives. My father's name was not always Oh sung a Korean name. As a child growing up under the Japanese occupation of Korea, he was forced to take the name Matsuyama Hideo, a Japanese name. If he used Korean or spoke Korean, he would be beaten. And now I, his son, serve as a missionary among the people he was taught to hate. And there is perhaps good reason, humanly speaking, to hate the Japanese. We talk about the horrors of the Holocaust when Nazi Germany killed six million Jews. Nazi German scientists performed inhumane medical experiments at concentration camps. Their victims were subjected to extreme cold and heat, sterilization, various diseases like malaria. According to historian Chalmers Johnson, the Japanese slaughtered as many as 30 million. Filipinos, Indonesians, Cambodians, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Chinese. 30 million. Possibly the greatest loss of human life in the history of mankind. There was a Holocaust in Asia, but no one seems to have noticed. Imperial Japanese scientists tested various chemical and biological weapons, such as bubonic plague and anthrax, on human victims. The scientists referred to the people used in these experiments as logs or monkeys. Women were impregnated by soldiers and doctors, their bellies sliced open, their babies removed, and then tested upon, leading to their death. Human vivisection was performed without anesthesia. Various body parts were cut off and blood loss tested. These included men, women, children, and newborn babies. Nazi scientists who visited Japanese medical experimentation facilities vomited from the horror of what they saw. 200,000 Korean women and girls as young as 12 years old were forced to be sex slaves of the Japanese Imperial Army, subject to rape dozens of times per day. They are known today euphemistically as the comfort women, really an offensive term. Many of them ended up dead as we can see in this picture, a ditch filled with the dead bodies of women. Undergirding all of these medical and sexual atrocities was a racist ideology that sought to subdue and civilize and subject lesser races and peoples. On top of all of this, many Japanese leaders today still do not admit to any fault during Japan's imperialist past. They wonder why Koreans and Chinese and other Asians aren't more thankful. It should come as no surprise then that the question that people most often ask about our mission work is, why Japan? Of all the places in the world, why would a Korean person choose Japan? Um, Koreans ask me this, Americans as well, as Japanese also. The answer that I give is quite simply, Jesus says, love your enemies. I was speaking at a conference back in 2003 with 2000 uh, college students, and during the question and answer time, someone asked a question. They said, what do you like most about Japan? And for about 45 seconds, I was completely at a loss for words. I simply didn't know how to answer that question. Um, and then finally I said, there's just something 
inappropriate about the word like in terms of how I feel about Japan and why I'm in Japan. Uh, first of all, I'm not in Japan because I, I like sushi or Japanese comic books or PlayStation or anything like that. I think for some people, the thought of being a missionary is so perplexing that they assume, well, there must be some reasonable explanation. Uh, he must like sushi or something. And secondly, although I admit that there's really not so very much that I just, on a human level, just like about Japan that would make me decide to live there, I can say with all my heart, I love the Japanese. I love the Japanese. The Japanese are an amazing and wonderful people. They are engineering geniuses, and they are kinder than almost all the Christians that I know. It's an honor to serve alongside my Japanese brothers and sisters. Are there any Japanese Christians here today? Can you stand if you are Japanese Christian? Are, are there any? All right. All right, a few. Awesome, like three or four. Okay. They're only like one in a thousand of Japanese who are really like true Christians. So take a picture <laughs> with one of them, in, the endangered species. But it won't always be that way. Amen? But unfortunately, Japan has a dark history that must be confronted and this dark history, again, has contributed towards what might possibly be the greatest loss of human life in the history of mankind. But I love the Japanese people, and I'm willing to lay down my life that they might know Jesus. Japan is a, a, a nation that is spiritually lost. They worship eight million gods, but so few know the one true God. The Protestant church-going population of Japan is 0.21%. The evangelical population may be closer to 0.15%. There are 183,000 cult groups officially registered with the government. They are the cult capital of the world. They are a nation that is also sexually lost. The historical legacy of uh, the so-called comfort women is continued today as there are 150 to 200,000 Filipino and Thai women who are being exploited in the Japanese sex industry, having been lured by so-called entertainment jobs. I was in Thailand in 2004 uh, at the Lausanne Forum where I met a woman named Patricia Green, uh, the founder of Rahab Ministries, uh, where they seek to rescue Thai girls from prostitution. And she told me that 70% of the tourists who come into Thailand are men. 70% of those men will participate in the sex industry. And the majority of those men are Japanese. I've walked down the streets of Pattaya, Thailand with friends praying with tears in my eyes as I saw not only women involved in prostitution walking hand in hand with their Japanese clients, but also young girls and young boys. And I apologize to Patricia. I said, I'm not Japanese, but I apologize on behalf of the Japanese. And I apologize on behalf of the Japanese church, who unfortunately right now, it seems too much so that they don't give a damn about what's going on. And Japan is also a nation that is relationally lost. There's a phenomenon known as hikikomori, where people refuse to work or participate at all in normal life. Young men, mainly, um, who sleep all day, and if they venture out at all, it's at night to their local convenience store to pick up some cup of noodles and pornography. 
There are today in Japan close to 1.5 million young men who are hikikomori. Many families are breaking down from the lack of real communication or love. Young girls in Japan are so desperately seeking fatherly attention that many have even turned to teenage prostitution. Having a dirty old man touch you and pay you doesn't seem to me like a fair substitute for a father's love. So the Lord called me and my family and our team、uh, to love the Japanese people. And I invite you also to love the Japanese.、Uh, growing up, I was the one who needed to be loved. And I was desperate to be loved. Like the Beatles said, you know, all you need is love. And I looked around me at all the different relationships that I had, and friends, and family, and, and the overwhelming feeling that I had with every single relationship in my life, at least my perception was that. I loved, I liked, I loved everyone else more than they liked or loved me. That was tiring and depressing and painful. And I thought the answer was a girl, to find a girl. And you're not going to like this, girls. But my goal, basically, I thought. Was to find someone, a girl, who loved me more than I loved her. Terrible. But that certainly isn't the answer. And God was gracious to me in my high school years. He protected me from dangers all around me. Got really close to the fire in so many different ways, but God was gracious in protecting me. And then finally,、uh, my sister dragged me to a Christian conference the summer of my senior year of high school, and I was confronted with the very simple words by the preacher, and he said, If you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going? And I jumped. Into the arms of Jesus Christ that night, or rededicated my life to Jesus Christ that night. And I went to university, and it was just wonderful being surrounded by young Christians like all of you who really know God and love God. And it was exciting to grow and to, to learn and to, and to be a part of true Christian family for the first time in my life as a young believer. And it dawned on me in those first few months you know what? I found the one who loves me more than I love him. You know, so many people grow up and leave. Home to go to college, and they leave college with the goal to be somebody. And being somebody usually means getting a really good job, making good money, buying a really nice house, driving a really nice car, attaining some really important position, and helping your kids to do the same. For the Christian, you know, being somebody usually means all of that, and, you know, faithfully going to church on Sundays and maybe going to a Bible study during the week. But I believe that Jesus Christ is calling for people to be a nobody for Him. People who would forsake the American dream to be a part of bringing gospel hope to the lost and to the nations. People who don't mind if they're not recognized, respected, rewarded, praised, or promoted, as long as the name of Jesus is cherished, worshiped, exalted, and adored. People who understand that Jesus Christ didn't come to this world and die on a cross so that we could have a comfortable suburban life and enjoy going to a great church on Sundays. Jesus is calling people who could compete in the corporate rat race and win, but either choose not to do so so that they can share the gospel with Thai prostitutes. Or who excel in business or, medic, or medicine or, or law 
who live radically missional lives, sharing the gospel and giving gobs of money away to the poor and to the lost, to the utter disbelief of co-workers. I believe that Jesus Christ is calling for well-trained, well-educated, godly, capable, wise, talented nobodies. You know, so many Sunday Christians are spending all their energies and passions on trying to be somebody. And they're not going to change this nation. They're not going to change this world. And it's not just about the global and eternal impact of such life or the lack of it. It's really a question of, is that even Christianity? You know, we kind of have the idea that there are like two types of Christianity, like normal Christianity, where you kind of hold to some basic set of orthodox beliefs and can perform a set of kind of minimal religious duties, including Sunday worship attendance, no cursing, no visible tattoos, unless it's a cross, of course, uh, no earrings for the guys, unless it's a cross, of course, and your occasional personal, you know, Bible reading and prayer. That's normal Christianity. And then you have kind of like radical Christianity. And that's where you actually have to like really pay attention to what Jesus taught, to how Jesus lived, and even detailed attention and obedience to the actual teachings of Scripture. And radical Christianity includes things like fasting, sacrificial giving, inner city living, overseas going, gospel sharing, self-denying, cross-bearing. It's kind of like normal Christianity is like, like regular chemistry. And then there's like AP Christianity. <laughs> and people are like, well, I'll take regular Christianity because I already have enough AP classes to deal with. But there's only one faith, one gospel, one hope, one version of Christianity. The normal Christian life is a radical Christian life. And the radical Christian life is the normal Christian life for all Christians. I invite you to come be a part of the radical, normal Christian life. I think this domesticated, safe, innocuous, Sunday, normal Christianity, I think it really flows from a false gospel. Or at least a very much incomplete gospel. You know, we've domesticated the gospel. We've domesticated the Christian life. We've neutered it. We've ripped its claws out. The gospel is either everything or it's nothing. Jesus on the cross either saved the whole of who you are for eternity and demands the whole of who you are for eternity in allegiance and affection and worship to God or it's nothing. And it's not that we work and we live and we obey to pay Jesus back because you can't. And it's not to make him love you more because he can't. And it's not to prevent him from loving you less because he can't. There's nothing you can do that would make him abandon you. I know that some of you feel like God must have a really disappointed look on his face when he sees you. You've tried to live for Christ and you haven't done very well. You've struggled with sin. You've struggled to live for God. Brothers and sisters, never stop seeing yourselves as God sees you. God loves and accepts you as much as he loves and accepts 
His Son, Jesus. Not only is He not disappointed in you, He sees your life as joyfully, as proudly, as if all the good, all the obedience, all the love that Jesus Christ showed while living on this earth were done by you. If you believe that God accepts you more on your best days and less on your worst days, you are a Muslim and not a Christian. If you believe that you are more righteous on your best days and less righteous on your worst days, you are a Pharisee and not a Christian. If you believe that you are more lovable to God on your best days and less lovable on your worst days, you are an orphan and not a child of God. Christians, I know exactly how God feels about you. You are perfectly divinely, perfectly, eternally, without hesitation, without doubt or degree, unconditionally, undeniably, irrefutably, perfectly loved. And that, brothers and sisters, is the gospel that God loves and accepts and feels about you everything that he loves and accepts and feels about Jesus Christ. It's astonishing, amazing good news. Christ's righteousness, your righteousness, even at your very worst moment. Christ's sonship, your sonship, even at your very worst moment. It's a radical gospel that gives radical motivation and power to live the radical, normal Christian life. I love how um, John Piper sums up reality so clearly and challenges us so passionately. And Piper says something very simple that we all have just three choices. He says we can go, send, or disobey. So I want to come back to missions here. Uh, not that everyone is called to go as missionaries, but because I really think that missions is one of the most beautiful and costly expressions of the radical, normal Christian life. And for those of you who are called to stay and to live missional lives here in the U.S., I want you to know that a part of that missional life is as critical senders of missionaries who will lay down their lives in a very unique and difficult way among the unreached peoples and nations of the world. But it is my hope and my prayer for your generation and for those in this room that the very best and brightest of your generation will go and bring gospel hope to the nations. Young women and young men who could have been somebody in this world, choosing to be nobodies for Jesus, to be an unknown, unappreciated, unrecognized servant of the Lord among the lost of this world. And that doesn't mean that you have to go and, to be a pre and, go and be a preacher. Um, I don't think actually that there's a single job or profession that you can have in America that you can't do in the mission field. You can be a musician, a physician, a professor, a dog catcher, a secretary, an actuary, a bartender, mixed martial arts fighter for all I care. <laughs> Missions means being a Christian, living the Christian life where there are no Christians. Simple definition. Could you spend a tithe of your life being a Christian where there are no other Christians? My point is simply doing what the Lord has gifted and called you to do where there are few or no Christians so that those who cannot be saved without believing in the gospel can hear that life-giving gospel, that wonderful, astonishing news through you as you practice medicine, preach, or whatever it is that you do. It's choosing to forsake the comforts and glory of the American dream, living in the slums of Mumbai, or a jungle in Africa, or a concrete jungle in Asia, 
living in a foreign land and speaking in a foreign tongue. In other words, to be pretty uncomfortable and to really need God. That God might have the glory that he is worthy to receive. So you've been hearing this week about all the different kind of short-term opportunities, different ways to use your gifts and talents, and there's no end to how God can use you. You all have God-given talents that can make a huge impact in the mission field. Um, For example, um, raise your hand um, if you are one of those uh, people who speak English. There you go. Talent. In Japan, teaching English is probably the, 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 the most effective and clear, historically impacting mission ministries in Japan, speaking English. And again, it's about going and being where there aren't few or no Christians. Can I have the next slide, please? Each blue dot on this graphic represents 50,000 Christians, 50,000 Christians. So this is a, you can see a wonderful, um, you know, global presence of Christians throughout the world. It's a wonderful encouragement of how God is working in the world today. But there is a need for presence among those who have little or no opportunity to hear the gospel you have a huge concentration. All, almost all the unreached people groups are all there in white. And the definition, you could almost say, oh, well, what, what is the definition of where, where Christians are? Christians are where the unreached peoples are not. And what are the definition of unreached peoples? Unreached peoples are living where Christians will not go. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy that there are so few Christians who will go and share and suffer and obey and love the lost who need this life-giving message. So we need to go and have presence and be nobodies in those places for them to hear the gospel. And as I shared before, one of the biggest contributions and impacts that you can make for missions is also with your finances. And Jesus teaches that uh, our giving is an open window into our hearts. Let me share just a few statistics If you make $25,000 per year, you are the richest 10% of this world. $25,000. Congratulations, you are the uber rich. In fact, if you make $2,500 per year, you are the richest 15% of this world. That's like your summer job. If you make $50,000 per year, you are the richest 1% of this world. You know, when people ask me, well, how how much should I give to, like, the church and to missions? Um, I tell them, give sacrificially. In other words, don't give God the crumbs that fall from your table. In other words, don't give God the leftovers, your quote-unquote disposable income. Giving God your disposable income is is kind of like reaching under your couch cushion, you know, finding some extra money that you don't need and saying, here, God, it's it's, it's all yours. You can have it all. Go save the world. I believe that in some sense, true, really God-honoring giving begins at the point of sacrifice. When it really starts to cost you something. So guys, next time you go on a date with your girlfriend or with your wife, try giving her something that costs you nothing. No money, no time, no effort whatsoever, and you'll see what I mean. (laughs) Jesus' greatest offering to the Father was in sacrificing himself on the cross. Jesus gave not only his sweat and tears, but his blood. So if the Lord is calling you to business or medicine or law or some other job here and to stay here in America, by all means, make tons of money. Please do. And also sacrificially give eye-popping, scandalously huge amounts of it away for the glory of Christ 
all around the world. It's not your money to give. It's God's money to invest. So again, don't forget my challenge to consider a tithe of your life for missions and a tithe of your money for reaching the unreached peoples of the world. I sometimes have challenged college students to commit to giving a year of your life for missions, just one, one year. We each have been given just one life. The measure of your life will not be what is gained or accomplished in this world. The measure of your life will be what is gained for Christ for eternity. The measure of your life will be the glory that Jesus Christ receives globally and eternally. So don't waste your life playing with toys. Don't waste your life trying to make a name for yourself, but give your everything that the name of Jesus Christ might be exalted both here and even to the very ends of the earth. As for me, I'm nobody. In fact, that's been confirmed by an important and old leader in Asia. Uh, apparently in a meeting, um, my name came up, and he was there, and this was his response. Who is Michael O? Oh? He's not even really Korean. He leads just a small school in Japan. Even the important leaders, Japanese leaders, don't know him. I don't know why he's on the executive committee of Lausanne. When I heard this, I rejoiced. Who is Michael O? Oh? Nobody. Praise God. That night, I wrote in my journal, Lord, make me like the widow of Mark 12, nameless and poor, but pouring out all the little I have for Jesus Christ. I aspire to be like that widow, attracting the derision of vaunted and venerable established leaders and attracting the compassion and attention of my Lord. Tonight, may the Lord help me to pour out my two coins worth for his glory. You know, I, I could have been somebody. I could have been a somebody. Everyone who knows me knows that I could have made a, a ton of money if I wanted. Um, I have four Ivy League degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard University. I have three master's degrees and a PhD. Um, uh, between my sister, my two brothers-in-law, my wife and me, the five of us, we have 15 college and graduate degrees, including degrees from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, and the University of Pennsylvania. And now all five of us have spent significant time in the mission field or are missionaries. And when some people hear of this, uh, and when some people hear of this, especially Asian parents, they think it's tragic. <laughs> like my, my parents here, like, I'm so sorry to hear about your children. <laughs> but others see it like the pouring of ridiculous, ex ridiculously expensive and precious perfume upon the feet of Jesus Christ. So why choose to be a nobody when you could be a somebody? Because life isn't about us. It's not about how much money you can make. It's not about how secure and comfortable you can be. It's not about making a name for yourself. It's not even about living a quiet life and going to church on Sundays. Not only is it not about us, it's also not even about them. It's not about the Japanese or other nations and peoples that are lost without the gospel. It's ultimately about God. It's about God who deserves to hear from every one of his servants for whom he died. Lord, I would go anywhere for you. Lord, I would do anything for you. It's about Christians realizing that we have absolutely no right to tell God, I'll do this or this for you, but not that or that. I'll go here or here for you, but not there or there. It's about Christians understanding how 
globally and cosmically worthy God is to be worshipped and glorified and adored and how incredibly hard the task of making him known is and how great the sacrifices needed are to see that happen. It's about Christians who so want Jesus Christ to be somebody to every tribe, language, people, and nation of this world that they are willing to be a nobody to see it happen. Last slide, my father um, always wanted me to be somebody, and he did everything he could to make that possible. Uh, My father and my parents came to this country with $300 in their pockets, lived in a tiny apartment in South Philadelphia surrounded by the mafia and gangs uh, above an old laundromat. Uh, My father worked so many hours uh, each week, I hardly saw him, hardly knew him. But eventually, you know, we moved out of our inner city apartment and began to make a pretty good living. And that allowed me to have so many great experiences that so many kids can't have. And uh, then one Sunday during my senior year in college, um, I had lunch with my father and I told him that I wanted to be a missionary. And my father said, no. And then he said, Michael, I want you to stay here in America, and I want to see you at church every Sunday, and eventually you'll have children. I want to see your children, and we want to have, I want to have lunch together like we always do after church. And then I said to him, I said, Dad, I appreciate everything that you've done for me and for my older sister, Tina. Um, that's why we are where we are today. But I refuse to live my life just to try hard to get into a good college so I can get a good job and make lots of money so that my kids can have every opportunity to get into a good college and get a good job and make lots of money so that their kids can have every opportunity to get into a good college and get a good job and make lots of money. I refuse to live my life like that. And honestly, I don't even remember what he said after, me, after that to me. Um, I don't even know if he even dropped me off at my dorm or if he made me walk. But I ask you, is that why Jesus died? So that we can get a good job and make lots of money so our kids can have every opportunity to get into a good college and get a good job and make lots of money so their kids can have every opportunity. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says this, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Did Jesus die so that we could be comfortable? Did Jesus die so that we could be somebody and go to church on Sundays? Did Jesus die so that you could pursue the American dream? Each one of you, after you graduate or as you progress in your careers, you can be somebody. You can build your own kingdom. You can make a name for yourself. You can be really, really comfortable. You can be respected. You can be recognized. And you can help your kids to be somebody one day as well. Or you can be a nobody. For Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to be a nobody for Jesus. Mm